All right, here we go. We have funk royalty in the building. <laughs> Morris Day, lead singer of Morris Day in the Time, with classic hits like Jungle Love and Jerk Out. The Bird. The Bird. <laughs> Gigolos Get Lonely too. yes. That's right. <laughs> and last but not least, musical collaborator with the one and only Prince. Rest in peace. Well, you have a new book out, which I got to read. Awesome. And the name of the book is? On Time. That's right. <laughs> That's right. A Princely Life in Funk. Right. And I think what I like about the book is that you kind of have conversations with Prince throughout the book in his own voice, which is kind of dope. Yeah, I thought that concept was good. The last thing that I wanted to do was do a book and just straight tell the story. You know, I wanted it to be different, have a little different, you know, edge, angle, uh, whatever you like uh, to it. And I think we came up with it. Very cool. Well, yeah. There's, there's going to be a link under all these videos. Awesome. You can actually go and purchase the book. Nice, nice. Uh, so definitely check it out. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to get into your whole story. Yeah. So you grew up in, well, you were born in Springfield, Illinois. That's right. Where did you actually grow up? Grew up in Minneapolis. Uh, my mom got us up out of Springfield when I was about eight years old. Went up to Minneapolis. As the story goes, stopped to visit a sick aunt. And we were supposed to be on our way to California. Ended up staying in Minneapolis for the next 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and your mom, I guess, get, got married at 16? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Was your dad around? No, he wasn't around. Yeah, he was uh, in the service and uh, over in Germany, which I probably have some siblings over there <laughs> that I don't know about. But anyway, so he was doing his thing and, uh, you know, they just, you know, Part of he ways. missed out. Yeah, yeah. He definitely missed out. <laughs> okay, so here you are growing up in Minneapolis, and I guess Prince lived at his mom's house down the street from you? I didn't know that. Yeah, I grew up, uh, we, we, we uh, first moved to south side Minneapolis, then we moved over uh, north side to my aunt and uncle had a, I think you call them bungalows, where they, the same house, but they split into two side by side. We lived on one side and I didn't even really, you know, Prince had a nice house, you know, this nice dog, you know, one of them big poodles and shit, you know, and, you know, he lived right down and I used to see him in Taika, you know, out playing. And uh, I met him really years later, but for that time I lived right around the corner from him. Okay. And you guys met in high school. Pretty much, yeah. And you were already a drummer. Yeah. And I guess you joined a band that he was already in? He had a band called Grand Central, him and Andre Simone. And uh, Andre and I got kind of tight because uh, I went to see these guys at, uh, it's all in the book, by the way, but you know, I'm going to give you little tidbits. And uh, I went to see them at a lunchroom after a school Friday night concert or dance, I guess it was. And um, I was just mesmerized by these guys, man. They were like 14, 15 years old. Uh, Prince was playing like Carlos Santana solos and Hendrix and just, I mean, flawlessly, you know, not trying to chop his way through. And uh, the band was super tight. Um, and I, I was just like in awe. And I uh, got to know Andre from that. Uh, we start hanging out, uh, you know, smoke a little weed together. One day we skipped school, uh, went over to my house, smoked some weed, you know, and I, had my drums upstairs, you know, so I had this big speaker behind my drums and, um, you know, I blast some Tower Power. I started, you know, knocking out some uh, What is Hip and some Soul Vaccination, you know, and just because I was really into Dave Garibaldi and Tower Power at the time. I mean, among others, but I was just something about the way Garibaldi played that intrigued me. And I patterned myself in a funkier way behind Dave. And so anyway, I got done hitting these songs, man. I, you know, turned my turntable off and Andre's sitting there with his jaw drop. He's just staring, man. I was like, what's up, man? He's like, dude, I didn't know you could play like that. And uh, he's like, man, it just so happens that our drummer, we're having problems with him, who was Charles Smith. We called him Chaz and that was Prince's cousin. Uh, so he said, you should bring your drums by and try us out, man. You know, you know, ch you know audition. And so I did uh, a couple of days later, my drums never left. <laughs> well, I guess uh, when you first met the band, everyone was really friendly except for Prince. Yeah. He was yeah. kind of like standoffish. Yeah, very much. Prince was always in the cut. Uh, and true to form, he's never changed, but he, he was just, 
sort of, I guess, checking me out, you know, and, 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 and you know, um, he was real cautious. We only talked music arrangements, this and that songs and stuff like that. And, you know, aside from that, you know, he was in the cut, you know, just kind of looking. And, you know, finally, you know, uh, maybe a month went by. We started to talk a little bit, you know, sort of broke the ice. And, um, you know, eventually um, through it all, we became uh, really good buddies. Well, I guess back then in high school, he had an afro, yeah. <laughs> a turtleneck, <laughs> bell bottoms, and pink girl gloves yeah. with the fingers cut off. Yeah, they, they wasn't even... You know, fingers, there was big mittens, <laughs> the big girl mittens. <laughs> <laughs> and he always had this kind of metrosexual vibe to him, even back in high school. Absolutely. Even before I knew what this metrosexual, you know, I, I, you know, come to know that word. But before I knew what that shit was, yeah, he was he was on that tip. Right. And I guess he took a lot of his style from like hairdressers and like feminine, you okay. know, like ways and so forth. But he really knew how to kind of. He, also keep it macho at the same time. He, he got a kick out of, uh, yeah, the, the gay hair stylists and stuff and the way they talked the stuff they laughed at, and, you know, and he incorporated in some of that and the, the way uh, the, the, the grace and all of that. And, 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 you know, he just got a kick out of that stuff. Okay, but you said that he was always straight as a gate. As far as I know, <laughs> you know, as far as I know, you know, he was into the girls. All right, because he really pushed it at one point. I remember, I think... It really came to the extremes when he had like the pants with like the butt cheeks hanging the, out. The dirty that and uh, the dirty mind uh, album, you know, the, the leg warmers and the hot pants and the you know all of that. That was that even you know all of you know the you know the guys in the band and me and you know, everybody was just kind of sitting back now. Where's this going and where's it coming from? <laughs> right, I'm looking at the dirty mind cover right now. Yeah, I mean that's. That's kind of different, but not not like the, the, the open butt cheek pants. Yeah, that was a step further, you know. <laughs> it, it, it was all out there, you know, out of my lane for me, so, you know. <laughs> right. That was one of those things that no one really copied. It was like when he wore those pants, well, he pretty much was the, the one of one of that. The thing about Prince, and that's, an, uh, that's a testament to his uh, genius, that he's such an incredible musician, entertainer, that, you know, guys who normally wouldn't even like uh buy somebody's record who dressed like that he got a hall pass because he was such an incredible uh entertainer right you said in the book that he was a different breed like you were a serious drummer but yeah. he didn't just play music he was oh, the no, music. absolutely lived it 24 7. you know i always turn the lights out you know uh at some point and um you know the only time prince would is just to just to uh maybe fill in time when he couldn't uh, be doing music but you know I've never been a workaholic so you know that's kind of where we clashed a little bit because uh, I couldn't you know when I moved out to the suburbs I couldn't even go to the grocery store without running into this dude and I'd be like trying to take the evening off you know uh, go out to a club or do a little something and he'd be like come by my house tonight we're recording <laughs> all the time he just this dude never stopped man so at one point he left uh, Grand Central yeah. And one solo. Yeah. Was that like a big blow to the group? Well, when he left the, the group, it was sort of, it was a blow because, you know, that trying to find somebody to fill that spot never happened. You know, we found guitar players and, and we, we carried on, you know, but it, it just wasn't the same. Yeah, tried to replace Prince. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck imagine, with that. Imagine that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that wanted ad, looking for a Prince replacement. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so he went solo. Yeah. And he got signed. Yeah. And then one day, you're hanging out in Minneapolis and you heard Soft and Wet on the radio. Actually, I was hanging out in... Maryland. I, I lived in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, my mom moved us there and I was uh, working at a car rental counter at, uh, I believe it was called Montgomery Wards and they had a little car rental counter in there and I was working there. Now I'm standing up one day and uh, Soft and Wet comes on the radio and that was pretty incredible for me because that was almost like me hearing my own music because you know, we grew up together. So, you know, I'm standing there and I'm telling random people, oh, that's my buddy on the radio right now. And they're looking at me like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that's how that went. Okay. 
So he moved to, well, you moved away. Yeah. He formed his own band, The yeah. Revolution. That's right. And The Revolution already had a drummer. But at one point, you came back and you hooked up with him again. Yeah. But like I said, The Revolution already had a drummer. <laughs> and I was coming back to town to get that job, too. That was my slot. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I can play better than Bobby Z, so this should be a, a no-brainer. So, you know, Prince was blunt. You know, he's always, you know, he never, you know, uh, he, he always gave it to you straight. He's like, no, nah, I already have a drummer. I go, okay. He said, but. You know, you can uh, come hang out and videotape the shows, which was a little bit of a slap in the face. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. <laughs> right. He became his cameraman, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And he went on tour with Rick James. Yeah. He opened up for Rick James, actually. And Rick James was on fire oh, yeah, at Rick, this point. Yeah. This was when Super Freak was out? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, right around there. Oh, yeah. So was that the first tour you went on? Yeah, I believe so. Um I think it was the, um, I don't, I think it might have been after that because it was actually the, the Dirty Mind tour. And I don't think he was opening for Rick at that time. But I could be wrong. It was a long okay. time ago. <laughs> All right. But at one point he did go on tour with Rick James. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember reading uh, Rick's biography and uh, Rick just hated Prince. I don't think, yeah, I think he hated him. I think it was a pressure thing, you know. I think um, I think it was more threatened by than hate. If I had to, you know, because you know Prince coming on strong, man. You know, he's 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 gaining momentum. Uh, you know, probably kicking Rick's ass some nights, you know, and and um, so I, I think it was probably more threatened, you know, by Prince than anything. Okay, and what exactly was happening on the tour between Prince and Rick James? Man, you know, I don't really know what was going on, you know, with them, you know, because uh, my thing was the cameras. I wasn't doing much hanging out back then. I was just camera, room, you know, and so, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't turned into MD yet. Okay. And Prince, even back then, was wearing the, the metrosexual type stuff he was wearing like the, the bikini underwear and the trench coat <laughs> yeah. and how were the crowds dealing with him back then opening up for rick james you know um he was he was holding his own you know and like i said you know because you know once they saw his musicianship and his ability to uh entertain and uh you know he got that hall pass you know the the women they they don't really care about that kind of thing anyway but guys especially you know uh gave him that hall pass because he's such a talented dude Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then at the end of that tour, he really didn't need Rick James anymore. He that was, was it. on fire on yeah, his own. Exactly. Well, And then he started opening up for the Rolling Stones. Were you on that tour? I was at one show, and it was, a, it was like a Woodstock Coachella kind of thing out in the middle of nowhere. And I could kind of see it coming on, man, because um, we, we, we get out here and you see all of these these dudes, man, hardcore biker looking dudes, you know, beards and motorcycles and tattoos and, you know, and then here comes Prince. I'm out at the soundboard, you know, and I'm seeing all this develop, man. And here he comes out, you know, uh, trench coat back, legs out and stuff, man. And these dudes, <laughs> they weren't having it, man. Next thing I know, I start seeing beer bottles flying up on stage and I was like, oh, shit, it's time to go. So I had to beeline. Uh, get backstage and c catch him coming off. We were straight into the car to the airport and back to Minneapolis right away. Well, right. I interviewed uh, Stokely Williams yeah. uh, of Mint Condition, who worked with Prince yeah. uh, later on. And he said, he told me about a conversation him and Prince had about that. And he said that that, that show was so bad. I mean, because guys were literally throwing beer bottles beer at bottles. him. And, yeah. and really yeah. was like, you know calling him gay and everything else oh, yeah, like that. Was, yeah, the, the whole tone just... Oh, yeah. <laughs> that he actually wanted to quit at that point completely, and Mick Jagger had to talk him, like, off the ledge. He talked about when he... Um, he's like, I'm Stokely, when I first went on my first tour, like that Rolling Stones thing, that first tour, but, or maybe it was. And he was talking about, I got booed. I was just like, man, I didn't want to come back. 
And he said Mick Jagger's the one that actually called him back because he quit. You know, he didn't want to go back when he got booed. It's like, I said, what'd you do? He said, I just walked off stage. What could I do? And he said, Mick is the one that actually called him back. You can't quit, man. Come back. And, you know, so I guess they finished the tour. You see, uh, that could be. Um, see, I didn't, I didn't catch that because the part that I caught was once I made it back, he was on his way out, car, airport. I know he was humiliated. And, um, you know, but he wasn't talking like quitting. <laughs> okay. I think that's a bit extreme for Prince. You know, that was, that, that was part of his being, you know. I mean, how did he feel about that whole experience? Oh, that that he, sounds pretty brutal. No, it was, it was crazy. He was humiliated. But you know what? I think, I think it motivated him, you know. Uh, so because, you know, we got right back. Uh, he was right back in the studio, you know, didn't miss a beat. And, you know, I just think that that somehow fueled his tank, you know, in a positive way. Well, Prince had a deal with Warner Brothers, and in that deal, it allowed him to bring other groups and artists under his deal. And one of those groups was The Time. That's right. So when Prince first approached you and said, hey, I want to produce you guys and, and so forth, how did you feel? Well, first of all, there was no time. Uh, it was just me. And... Um, Kind of around that time that uh, we got back from from the whole uh, Rolling Stones ordeal, you know, he said, if you want to use the studio, because I would stay at his house when he, you know, go on some shows or go do stuff in L.A., I'd stay at his house. And um, he's like, you want to um, get in the studio and cut some stuff, you know, you know, have at it. And I was like, great. So um, the first song I really cut um, ended up being Party Up. So um, he heard the song and he's he liked it so he was like uh you know i i want your song he said um i'll give you money you know 10 15 20 grand whatever he said and he said or i'll help you get a deal put a band together and i said that's what i'm talking about so that's what we did we started cutting we basically cut the whole album he and i and you know a few background singers and fill and stuff like but we cut the album right there at his studio um, a few songs in, uh, we had finished up Get It Up. He took that out to L.A. to Warner Brothers. Uh, Mo Austin and the crew heard it, and uh, they signed us uh, Sight Unseen. So then we went back, and we had like two weeks to finish the album completely, and we finished it. So basically, we put the band together after the album was done. Okay, and the group kind of, I mean, more stay in the time came out of a group called Flight Time? Most of the members were in Flight Time, and that was Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam's group, uh, super talented guys. Uh, you know, Prince didn't really want them. He wanted some other musicians that I had been working with. He used to come out to some of our shows, and I was in a band called Enterprise Band of Pleasure, and uh, there's a guy on bass, uh, Jeffrey McGraven. He really wanted Jeffrey in, and um, he was kind of going in a different direction, and I told him that I wanted Jimmy and Terry, because I had heard stuff that they had cut um, on a, what's the name, uh, you know, Funky Town, uh, you know what I'm talking about? The lead singer of Funky Town? Yeah, yeah, the lead singer, I, her name, uh, but I had heard some productions. Second. Cynthia Johnson. Cynthia Johnson. I had heard some productions they had done on with Cynthia, stuff that they had written and produced on her, and I was like, these guys are really good, you know, and so I really wanted them in the band, plus they were super solid players and entertainers. So we ended up using most of them because Monty was in their group. Uh, Jellybean wasn't going to be in the band because I was supposed to be the drummer. And that's what I wanted to do. I never wanted to be a lead singer, but I'm, I'm glad that it happened that way because drummers phased out after that. You know, back in the day, you used to be able to go from studio to studio, uh, you know, and, you know, make a thousand dollars a session and you could just do that all week long. But after drum machines started getting popular, right. which they were starting to get popular then, you couldn't do that. So, you know, I, I wanted to be the drummer and we had different people. Alexander O'Neill was going to be the lead singer at one point. Ah. And he wanted more money and we didn't have it. So we passed on him. We, we checked out a few girls uh, to maybe be the lead. And, you know, after we exhausted all of our, our options, uh, Prince was like, you do it. I was like, I don't know how to lead up a band, man. He's like, well, just be cool, you know. Put your hand in your pocket. So if you watch the cool video, 
you'll notice my right hand never comes out of my pocket the whole video. So I was following, you know, his advice through that. And then from there, just kind of mushroomed and, you know, uh, I learned how to be a lead guy. But um, yeah, it's a, it, that, that wasn't my plan. And by me being a lead singer, I was happy because then Jelly Bean was kind of sidelined. We were able to pull him into the band. And so it felt complete. Well, here you are in a band with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who went on to become the biggest producers ever. They did all the Janet Jackson stuff. I mean, New Edition. All of everybody. <laughs> they did everybody at some point. Yeah. But with Prince being Prince, he played every instrument on that first album. Yeah. And every instrument. And even your vocals, he laid them out and you had to do them note by note. Pretty much. How does a Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis really just sit back and say, okay, I guess we're not going to contribute at all to well, this? Like, it, it was, you know what? It was all of us because, you know, we had Jesse Johnson, Terry and Jimmy, um, myself. Uh, we were all busting at the seams creatively and really wanting to do our own music or to have, you know, some control over our music somehow. You know, we were getting offers from, uh, at one point, uh, Evelyn Champagne, Kings people came and wanted me to uh, produce a single on them. They offered me good money, but uh, couldn't do it because uh, he wasn't allowing it. Right. And actually, Prince was producing everything under Jamie Starr. Correct. A fake name because yeah. I guess he didn't want people to know that he was doing everything. I think, I think he, more than anything, he wanted to create that mystery. So there'd be tidbits, tidbits out there. Is Jamie Starr Prince? So he liked that mystery, you know? So he, he wasn't really hiding behind it, but, you know, it was just, it made it controversial. Okay, so you drop your debut album, The Time, 1981. Then you guys go on tour, on the controversy tour. And the two bands kind of started to beef during this tour. Uh, how bad did it get? It got bad. Um, Prince was like, he, he wants to play jokes, and he wants to fuck around, and... You know, uh, he wanted, you know, and, and mess with you when you're on stage, but and he'll tell you, don't do that when I'm on stage. So we're up here, you know, doing our show, and all of a sudden, eggs start flying by our heads, you know, and, and hitting some of the guys and stuff. And he's always just laughing, having off stage, just laughing, having a good time. We're on stage, you know, at an arena, you know, with thousands of people kind of watching this unfold. So. Uh, we get done and a couple of the guys were really pissed off. I was pissed because I was like, why are you going to mess with our show like that, man? So um, he said, yeah, you know, I, but you guys can't do that to me when I'm on stage. And we're like, OK. So everybody suited up. You know, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Jam had a big garbage bag over him taped on, you know, and we had eggs. <laughs> we, we started firing up. And, uh, the, we started firing them up with the eggs and right in the middle of his show, and he got super pissed. So it just turned into a big, I mean, uh, Jesse Johnson, they took him, handcuffed him to a coat rack in the dressing room. He tore the coat rack off the wall, came out trying to hit people in his band with it. It just turned into a big, a big fight. Yeah, sounds crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Okay, so I guess shortly after that time, Prince dropped in 1999 which was like his biggest song at that point. Yeah. That was just a monster, <laughs> a monster. When you heard 1999, what'd you think? I mean, I knew what he was going for with it. I knew he wanted to be a pop star. He wanted a big pop record with a big fat pop hook, you know, and when I heard it, I said, you did it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I mean, I remember when it was about to turn 2000, that song was played <laughs> to death. <laughs> he had people wondering if we was going to make it out of here. I know, right? <laughs> so you guys go on tour with him again for the 1999 Triple Threat Tour. Yeah. And I guess the band was uh, playing for Vanity Six right. at the time. And Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were starting to build themselves up as producers and they started doing a bunch of different uh, projects. They were doing the SOS band, uh, they were doing Climax, 
and there was a situation where they couldn't make it to a gig. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we, um, I mean, I knew uh, Terry and Jimmy were moonlighting, and um, I, I was like, awesome, because I really wanted to do the same thing. <laughs> so, um, but, and they would have gotten away with it, you know, but this particular show we had in Atlanta, I think, or were they in Atlanta? Anyway, we had a show. They got snowed in somewhere. They missed the show, and that was pretty much the beginning of the end. We, um, after that, we retreated to, um, I want to say Sunset Sound or Cherokee Sound, one of those studios uh, right up the road here on Sunset. And uh, Terry and Jimmy uh, Prince called them in for a meeting. We were cutting um, ice cream castles at the, at the time. And uh, Terry and Jimmy come in. I had no idea what he had in his mind. So uh, me and Jesse Johnson and Prince sitting in the studio. And Terry and Jimmy come in. And he's, uh, you guys are fired. <laughs> Just like that. And... Um, you know, I just kind of dropped my head because, and walked out of the studio because I never wanted to be in one of those bands with the revolving door. I was kind of like loyal to my bands and I always hated to see them switch members, whether it be a guitar player, a lead singer, bass player. You know, I just kind of liked, you know, the bands. I, you know, I get to know them the way I, you know, get to know them and I don't like to see that revolving door concept. So that's when I kind of realized that's where my band was heading and I wasn't, I wasn't too happy about it. Right, because uh, Monte Moore also uh, left the group yeah. right around that time. Yeah. And when you, you know, fast forward to Purple Rain, that's the current group. No Jimmy Jam, no Terry Lewis, exactly. no Monte. Right. It was the new band <laughs> at that point. Yeah. The new guys. Okay, which leads me into the next part. So then you guys start working on Ice Cream Castle. This is your third album? And you guys have had some strong records, but no huge smashes yet. So you guys, you guys start working on Ice Cream Castle, and you put together Jungle Love. How did that song come together? That song came together, a bass line submitted from Jesse Johnson really came, came up with the bass line, and Prince just took that ball and ran with it. Okay. Yeah. When you put, when you, yeah, sorry. When you first heard Jungle Love, did you know that was a hit? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Jungle Love sounded like a hit to me. Um, the Bird, I was on the fence with The Bird because we had a studio version of that song that was supposed to be on the album, and the studio version was just super funky and just clean, and it was hard hitting. And then Prince said, you know what? <laughs> he said, we're going to do the song live. He said, you guys are going to record the song live, and we're going to use that version on the album. So, which the live version, I mean, it was really cool. It was a, bri a brilliant idea, but I still was kind of hung up on wanting to put the uh, studio version out. But it gave us bragging rights because there's not too many bands in history who have hit records that they performed live, which was actual live recording. Yeah, great record as well. Yeah, yeah. But Jungle Love was my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep it 100 with you. I, you. I love Jungle Love. Yeah. That's my, my favorite song that you guys put together. Cool, cool. Point blank. And right around that time, that's when Purple Rain, the movie, was coming together. Right? Yeah. So I guess the whole movie, the way you described it in your book, was born and bred and shot in chaos. Pretty much. Explain that. Well... The, first of all, we're just doing business as usual, rec recording songs and, and uh, doing shows. And um, all of a sudden, we're, we're on a break, and Prince comes up, and he's like, we're going to do a movie. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've never done a movie before. So, you know, um, he, um, you know next thing you know, he's, he's got us going to doing stupid shit in my book, you know, like going to dance classes and, and going to uh, acting lessons and, and all of this stuff, you know. And, um, you know, it still didn't seem like it was going to be a reality necessary, necessarily because, you know, we were just, you know, doing all this stuff. But then it started to come together. You know, then all of a sudden a director comes to town and the script shows up and uh, it's starting to look like, you know, we're really going to do this. And um, 
so it to, to me you know people ask me did i know i'm like that was one of the most honest or innocent efforts because uh, we didn't we didn't in my opinion we didn't know what we were doing we were just <laughs> they you know the director uh showed us the script he sat me and jerome down and uh line for line we went through the script and he said okay this is what the script says what would you guys say and so we basically rewrote all of our parts and um next thing you know we we're shooting a movie and uh apollonia played the uh, love interest mm -hmm. Ooh, she was bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah she was uh what I, she was a vanity replacement is what happened you know because um all the way up until basically we shot the movie, it was supposed to be Vanity. Uh, her and Prince had a falling out at the last minute and the next thing I know, um, here comes Apollonia out of nowhere. I'd never heard of her before, never seen her before, but just right prior to us shooting the movie, here she come. Very similar look too, to, uh, Very similar. to Vanity. I think he was going for the same thing there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, him and Vanity, were they dating? Oh yeah, he he was hitting everything. Huh? Yeah, you, <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't be in Prince's <laughs> you couldn't be in his movie or on his record without you know. I mean, I <laughs> okay. Now you actually played the villain in Purple Rain. Yeah. You were the one trying to get Apollonia, and yeah. you know, and and you kind of had a beef with with Prince throughout uh, the film, and I guess that's actually based on the reality of you guys touring together. It, it, as, it, as it turns out, yeah, we had an element of that, you know, because um, I'm competitive. Prince is a super competitive individual, so, you know, um, we were always cool until, you know, we started touring, and once he realized that he had created this Frankenstein monster, we start kicking his ass on stage, and then, you know, that's when the tension came in. As far as um, in the movie and in real life really happened on stage. I mean, we weren't that competitive off stage, but as far as performing was, we were. So I think that the movie hits on that a little bit. But I had to live with, you know, everybody thought that was so real. So everybody, you know, a lot of, especially a lot of girls come up, you're so mean to Prince in the movie. I'm like, it was a damn movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Jungle Love music video was actually from the movie. Yeah. Which was pretty dope. It, it was like, you got to see the music video. Did it come out before the movie? I think it came out, no, it came out um, during. Right, because I remember, you know, being in, you know, being in school at the time and you're watching MTV and you watch the music video and you haven't seen the movie yet, but you're hyped up to see the movie because the music video is basically the movie. Exactly. <laughs> you know, between the live performance and all the cut scenes, it's like you get to really see what the movie's about in that music video. And it was also a smash uh, on top of that. Uh, and I guess the film cost $7 million to make. See, I never knew that. And it made $70 million at the box office. Yeah, I just know that um, because shortly after the movie, I, we did um, we did um, what do you call them um, out. We did um, I forget what you call them, but we did the um, uh, we shot some scenes in um, downtown L.A. because we were basically done with the movie and we just had some fill in shots to do. So that was it for me. I got to L.A. and, you know, like I told you, my mom had me in Minneapolis for 20 years. I said, so this is it. I'm in L.A. I'm staying. So I was basically out of the band. I was out of the camp and um, on People Magazine, I saw him, uh, you know, it said that Prince made 17.5 million that year. Uh, you know, and that was partly off of Purple Rain. And, um, you know, I told him about it because I made 50 grand and that was it. And I had to use that 50 grand to pay my band weekly. <laughs> This dude was shrewd, but uh, so I told him, I said, yeah, so you made, you know, 17 and a half mil last year. And he said, yeah, he said, that's a, he said, that's a little bit of an understatement, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the story goes that Prince actually had to use his own money to underwrite the budget because the studio wasn't really feeling it initially. And he had to, you know, basically use his own money to get this thing going. Yeah. And uh, the movie made 70 million at the box office and went on to to do better yeah. even after that now what was interesting 
was that even though the songs Jungle Love and The Bird were in the movie, they were not on the soundtrack. And the soundtrack sold 25 million copies. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he know what he, he knew what he was doing. He's like, I'm not sharing the movie money with you. So he said, I'm going to take your songs from the movie and put them on your own record, and I will have the soundtrack out. Were you pissed off about that? I, I questioned it. I can't say I was pissed off, but I did question it. I was like, you know, okay, this, because everything was so strategic with this dude. You know, he just always thinking. So, you know, I, I, knew, I knew that it was somehow cutting me out of something. <laughs> well, those songs ended up on Ice Cream Castles. Yeah. And that one, Double Platinum. Yeah. So you couldn't be that mad. No, I wasn't too mad about it, you know. So now you actually have hit songs under your belt. How did that feel? I mean, it felt great. Um, it was, you know what they say, it's nothing like, you know, the first time, you know. And, and, and so really that feeling when we had our first record and the single was Get It Up, I'm still working clubs in Minneapolis. Uh, I get a call from Prince and he's like, and we still hadn't really put our band together yet. He's like, you better start putting your band together. He said, you guys, he said, you have a hit record. And I was like, wow, you know, but Minneapolis, you're in a bubble. You know, there's no urban stations. We had, I think it was KMOJ. It, 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 it broadcasts sun up to sundown and about a three block radius. <laughs> it was an AM <laughs> station. So, you know, I didn't know. And so, you know, I put the band together and we're going out to do a showcase for Warner Brothers. And... Um, we got out of the uh, airport, we rented a station wagon, the whole band's piled into this station wagon, and we're on the 405, and no sooner we got on the 405, boom, Get It Up comes on the radio. And that feeling was incredible. We pulled over, and people looking at us like we're crazy, we're dancing and stuff, all up on the car, and, and that, you know, that was amazing. I think by the time we got to uh, the bird and jungle love, um, it, you know, it was exciting, but it wasn't as exciting as that first single. And plus, Jungle Love was on the radio so much, man. I think it, every every station, you know, I turned, you know, I would hear it. And I turned to another station because maybe I didn't want to hear it. And guess what? It was on. It was just the rotation was incredible. Well, right around that time, and a lot of people don't realize this, but, you know, Michael Jackson is always put on a pedestal. But around the Purple Rain time, Prince and Michael Jackson were kind of neck and neck. Absolutely. Because, you know, Michael had Thriller. Yeah. Prince had Purple Rain. And he had the movie on top of that. So he exactly. was a movie star. And Purple Rain, the sales were up there with Thriller. And I guess the two of them had a kind of like a, a rivalry. They did. But, you know, I think they kind of squashed it. I, I, um, I remember Prince told me that he went and met with Michael at some point, and I guess they talked about some stuff. Um, you know, I, I always thought that was an interesting comparison. I think that they were on the same level as artists, but I think Michael was, he was a straight entertainer. Well, Prince did it all. You know, Prince was the entertainer, the writer, the producer, everything. So to me, I just thought that made his worth, and not to try and take anything from Michael, don't get me wrong, one of the greatest that ever walked the planet, but I just thought that Prince as a, a, a rounded, I mean, was the whole package. Right, he was a musician, a songwriter. He didn't need anybody yeah. to, to get him from A to B to Z. He, you know, he could do it all himself. Yeah, Michael needed Quincy Jones. There you go. That's <laughs> all I'm getting at. Uh, Michael needed R. Kelly later. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. needed he needed producers. Yeah, he needed, he needed songwriters. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But Prince played like a hundred different instruments. Yeah, so. yeah. Did you ever see the two of them actually get into it? Because there was like this one video where they were like, like remember Hulk Hogan was there, and the two of them were kind of kind of battling on stage a little bit. Yeah, um, I never, I never really was around. You know, that was, you know, like I said, you know, I kind of. You know, we, we loaded up and did what we did, and then I got out of there. So a lot of that stuff really came about later. And, you know, Prince is one of them kind of cats where, um, you know, 
I never had his phone number, uh, not after I left Minneapolis. Um, so I never knew how to call him, and he always contacted me at some obscure hour of the night. My phone rings, and I, I mean, I had, you know, or I could count on one hand, I had some crazy cousins who called me in the middle of the night, but usually it'd be him. And he's got some kind of idea, something he wants to do. But um, no, I, I could never just pick up the phone and say, hey, what's up, you know, or nothing like that. It, it, he had to, it had to be him calling. Okay, so then in 1985, you guys actually split up. You walked away. Yes, more like 84, but yeah. Okay. No, it was, it's around 85, you're right. Okay. Yeah. What was like the final straw? The final straw for me was... Um, I got creative input, you know, I did a lot um, with the early records. You know, I always was in on the jam sessions and did the drum parts and played the drums on even a lot of his stuff, but um, I wanted to produce my own record and write for myself. And um, I asked him and, um, you know, he had uh, Steve Cavallo come up to my place in uh, Santa Monica there. and. You know, we talked it through, and and Steve's like, so you know, because I had already threatened to leave, and Steve's like, so you, you're telling me you want to produce and write and be in charge of your own project? And I said, yeah, that's what I want. And he said, okay. He said, so I talked to Prince about this, and Prince said, that's fine. He said, as long as he can be the executive producer, and in my mind. I knew what that meant. That meant the same shit, different day. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I get it. It's time for me to move on. So basically that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, in your book, you said Prince needed to control everything and everyone around him, including religion. And he believed that the Jehovah's Witness way of living was the way to live. And that he would, uh, you know, Prince had this rant that Morris, that you would call a sermon and I guess the sermon came in two parts. He said Prince didn't like confusion. He enjoyed clarity and feeling secure even with religion. It wiped out confusion. He wanted everyone on that same accord. So was the religion kind of a, a breaking point? Well, the, the religion came later. I was long gone. You know, that had nothing to do with me leaving. But it did have to do with later on. He's, you know, he came and he's like, you know, you come to our shows. And um, he always loved the shows. And he... Yeah, and then he said that after we did a show, inevitably a day or two later he would call. I got some songs, you know. I want you to come out. I want you to do this. So I was living in uh, in Atlanta at the time. And he calls me. I fly out to Minneapolis. I'm ready to cut songs. You know, I'm there to work. Well, I show up, and uh, he's like, "We're in the studio." He said, uh, "Let's, you know, go in my office, you know, before we start recording." And uh, and so he's, uh, he's like, you know, what, 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 what's really going to help me do this and for us to work together again is he said, us being brothers, we have to be on the same page. And he said, I can't do this unless I can bring you into the religion, unless we can pray together and believe, have the same beliefs and all of this. And uh, at that point, you know, even though my arms are probably like this, but my arms are crossed because I'm like, you know, I'm not trying to, to do that. I've never, I, I've never understood uh, Jehovah's Witness enough to, you know, subscribe to it, you know. And then after that, he had them like coming to my door in Atlanta like twice a week, you know. Oh, he would send Jehovah's Witnesses oh, yeah, to your door. To your door, you know, because that's part of their thing. In order to be a Jehovah's Witness, you have to spread the word. So you got to go knocking door to door. And I guess he considered himself doing it through his musical circle. But uh, yeah, he, sh he stopped the tape and I said, you know, um, I don't think I can do that. And he said, well, you go home and think about it. And he's like, you let me know. He said, once you, um, you know, uh, come to terms with it, uh, if you do, uh, we can cut. If not, you know, uh, I understand. And so I jetted back home and, and that was that. I hadn't, I didn't see him for a few years after that. Well, you felt that Prince was haunted by his dad. And I guess uh, right like a few weeks after his dad had passed, he ended up bulldozing his dad's house. Yeah. What was that about? Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I never, 
some things you just don't ask people, you know, and I never really, you know, had that on my brain, number one. And number two, even if it was, obviously it was a, a sensitive issue for him. So, you know, if he volunteered that information, I would have, you know, uh, uh, talked with him about it, but he never brought that up. And I heard about it, which I thought was interesting, but I uh, never talked to him about it. Well, one of the most famous Prince moments actually came on the Chappelle show where uh, <laughs> they did the whole basketball game yeah. thing. And I actually interviewed Mickey Free uh, from Shalimar, mm -hmm. who uh, was down with Prince during that time. Yeah. And it was actually there at the basketball game. Oh, damn. And uh, yeah, he said it went exactly like that. He actually said that Prince played like Michael Jordan. We're in our street clothes, bro. Remember, we just came from the club. Okay. So we're in our street clothes. So Prince said, give me the ball back. And I swear to you guys listening, wherever you're going to be, Prince took the ball and it was like Michael Jordan after that. <laughs> shot after shot, like pff, nothing but net. And I looked at Eddie and I was like, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. And after we were done, true story, Princess Cook at the time, her name was Randy, cooked us pancakes. <laughs> Blouses. Was Prince really that good at basketball? He was good, man. He was a good basketball player. Yeah. You know, little, agile, really quick, had decent jump shot. Yeah. Okay. So you leave Princess Camp and you start dropping solo albums. You did uh, Daydreaming. Yeah. In 1987. Yeah. How did that do? It did okay. Uh, the, the first one was Color of Success. And that one, you know, uh, went, went platinum. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And uh, Daydreaming, uh, it's, it's, it might have got gold, you know, something like that. But Okay. I mean, solid numbers. Yeah. yeah. Solid numbers. Yeah. But you ended up actually coming back. Uh, to Prince's camp and doing Pandemonium. Yeah. Why? Well, here's what happened. Again, now this was before the religion thing, because the religion thing happened later on. But um, he wants me to come to uh, Paisley Park, so we're going to cut a record. But uh, first of all, I, we had, uh, me and Freeze, uh, my bass player, Ricky Freeze, we write a lot together. We had submitted some songs to Prince to listen to, and he dug one of them. And so he took it, rewrote it, layered it, and called it Corporate World. And um, so we ended up, he wanted to do a whole record and call the, uh, the project Corporate World. So we did that. So we finished the record. Jerome was in on it, um, me and Prince again. Um, and uh, so we finish, and then all of a sudden, the movie Graffiti Bridge comes into the pictures. Now we're going to do another movie. This is halfway through the Corporate World album. And Jimmy and Terry decided they wanted to be involved. So we pretty much scratched the whole Corporate World album and started new with Jimmy and Terry, and that's how we went into Jerk Out and all of that stuff. Right. And what's interesting about the Pandemonium album is that there's a song called Donald Trump, <laughs> Black Version. Yeah. Which I was listening to on the way here. <laughs> Very it's cool, ironic. It's a cool song, though. You know, <laughs> but we, in 2019, right. it gets lost in translation a little right, bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess Donald Trump was just a baller back then. He was a rich that's guy. All, that's, that's how people were, the money were addressing man. him. Yes. He was the money man. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So you guys come back, and you do you do the Pandemonium album, and then Jerk Out was the big single off of that. Yeah, and you do the whole mirror thing in the music video once again. You, you originally did it in Jungle Love. Yeah. And then, uh, I guess it was Jerome. Yeah. What was holding the mirror yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. How did that thing even come together? Well, that, that came together, um, the song Cool, uh, Somebody Bring Me a Mirror. Um, we had already been on tour. We were back rehearsing again, revamping the show at this little uh, rehearsal hall in South Minneapolis called the Yasm. I forget what that was, something backwards, I'm sure. But anyway, we're doing cool, and I'm like, somebody bring me a mirror. And Jerome just, you know, hopped up, ran into the bathroom, snatched the mirror off the wall, and then next thing I know, he's standing in front of me with the mirror. And <laughs> all the guys, were just kind of looking at each other like, this shit's pretty cool, man. So Jerome went from being, at that time, he was like our 
valet. You know, he did all the luggage and all that stuff. So he, that was his introduction to the stage, man. He was he was in after that. Well, around that time, Prince had just done the Batman soundtrack. Yeah. And he was messing with Kim Basinger, who was like <laughs> the hottest girl at the time. And I guess because of the whole Batman thing, the Jerk Out video had some interesting cameos. Um, oh, yeah. Jack Nicholson was actually in the music video. Quincy Jones was in the video. You end up taking his girl. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, Sugar Ray Leonard yeah. was in the video. It was yeah. <laughs> pretty star, star-studded video there. Yeah, it was. And, you know, uh, Jerk Out was actually, even though it's not our most popular song, it was actually our highest charting song. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the song you said, you ain't got to go, but you got to get the hell up out of here. Was that the first time that, that was said? Uh, well, I, first time on record. Yeah, you know, because you you, you 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 know you keep hearing that over the years. Yeah, but yeah. you coined that phrase, I guess, on that record. No, I didn't. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you, we used to do clubs, and uh, we used to do this club called the Riverside, and there's a MC, uh, I forget his name, and he would say that at the end of the night. He's like, you know, after the bands. We're done playing, and he's wrapping it up, and he's like, you ain't got to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. And, you know, it just came back. You know, we, that was one of them lines that we just, you know, we're going to use this at some point in time. Yeah, and uh, it worked for that record. <laughs> well, the time got back together, did the album, and then things fell apart again. The group broke up once again. Well, the group... You know, the, the group never stood a chance at that at that point because everybody, it used to be where we had some kind of, 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 of leadership and some direction. But once, uh, once we got back together to do that record, uh, Jesse Johnson, he already, you know, uh, had some solo success. Terry and Jimmy were off the charts. They were through the roof. Um, so it went from having maybe a chief and a co-chief, and then some Indians to having a room full of chiefs. Well, we couldn't get nothing done because everybody's opinion counted or, or you know took precedence over you know. So it was just hard. We couldn't get nothing done. You know, based on the book, things started to go kind of downhill for you after that. Uh, your marriage wasn't going well. Marriage wasn't going well. Um, you know, I was. I, I don't know. I was in a funk. You know, I couldn't. Um, I couldn't think, and I, I think that it was my way of saying I'm gonna take a break. That even though I didn't consider myself taking a break, I just looked up one day, and I went from, uh, you know, my house uh, in in the hills to sleeping on my uh, sister's uh, living room floor, and I couldn't figure it out. Um, and I didn't really have the ambition. To figure it out at the time. Now there have been times in my life where I, early on, had a, a serious drug problem, and uh, that I got past, got through it, kept going. But this thing wasn't drugs, alcohol, nothing like that. I just, um, I just didn't have it, and so I looked up and I was on my sister's uh, sleeping on the floor, and uh, one day I'm sitting up in her little dark studio apartment, didn't get much sunlight, and um, a buddy of mine, Ron Sweeney, uh, called me and he's like, what are you doing? I was like, uh, I don't know. He's like, well, why don't you put the band back together? <laughs> and just like that, a light went off in my head. And, you know, um, next thing I know, the guys, I got the guys back together. Um, we put the show together and never looked back. You know, the phone's been ringing off the hook ever since. Right, because I guess nine years passed until you saw Prince again. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah, and uh, I guess you're supposed to open up for him, and uh, it didn't work out. Now, if you're talking about the um, Target Arena show, yeah, yeah, he um, he had us fly to town. You know, I, good faith. I I fly my band in. First of all. He's got us at this little rustic, like, wood cabin uh, hotel out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not staying here. So I went and got, you know, the nice little, you know, five star right across the street from the Target Center. I'm posted up. And it's about maybe an hour before the show. And I, we get a phone call. Uh, Prince changed his mind. He doesn't want you guys to open for you. 
him tonight. I'm like, okay. I'm like, so I said, okay, so I get that. I said, so can you give me some money just to reimburse me for my out of pocket? You know, I got my guys here. I, you know, I pay them. I pay them per diem. I pay their uh, whatever, you know, if, if I bring them out, I pay them. And I said, and plus my airfare. I said, can I get, and they're like, uh, Prince said no. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, this is some bullshit. So anyway, um, he ended up giving me, um, I, I, we went to rounds and I ended up giving me enough money to uh, reimburse me for the airfare. And I got the guys home and I said, you know what, that's it. You know, I said, um, no more calls because he had done this several times and changed his mind. I said, no more calls. I said, I'm not leaving the house for this dude unless he pays me 100% up front. Yeah, Prince has this interesting sort of, you know, generous cheap thing that kind of <laughs> has went on the whole time. Because I remember I interviewed Curtis Blow at one point, and they were doing a, a music video as a tribute to Martin Luther King. And uh, back then, music videos were expensive. Yeah. You couldn't just pick up a, a video <laughs> camera, you know, right, like right, a, right. an iPhone and shoot a music video. Exactly. And uh, he said that they didn't know where they were going to get the money for the music video, and they went to Prince. And they needed like 50000 Prince just wrote him a check without any credit or anything. And he was like, yo, man, thank you so much. And Prince was like, hey, man, smart as the king. Don't even mention it. Yeah. And he would like literally just throw off 50000 like that, but yeah. then when yeah. it comes to reimbursing your airfare, right, right, <laughs> right, the, like seventeen and a half million that year, I was like thinking, now I helped make that movie. I'm like, uh, I wonder if you're going to you know, write me a little check, you know? But that never happened. <laughs> well, you guys continued to, uh, you know, to play. Uh, you guys were in the Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back movie, and I guess you you called yourself the original Seven at one point. That was when we uh, got together and decided as, as the time that we were going to do a record. Uh, Terry and Jimmy wanted to do a record. And uh, of course, Prince said, no, you can't use the name. So <laughs> we uh, had Prince, to... Wait, hold on, hold on. Prince really <laughs> had a problem with you guys using the name that far later? You know what? This dude is, was such a control freak that um, I thought that, you know, because I renamed the group. It used to be the time. When I started touring, I changed it to Morris Day in the time. I thought, I said, wow, I've been doing, you know, doing this for years now. And I said, I haven't had any problems with Prince. I was like, you know, the dude, you know, he's finally coming around. You know, he's not trying to squash me. But then I later found out that legally I can't use the time to record, but he can't stop me from using the time as a touring name. So legally there was nothing he could do. So I, I just wonder if he might have tried to uh, shut me down. <laughs> because he wasn't letting us use that name um, for the record. Were you around him when he changed his name to the, the symbol? A couple times. I mean, I wasn't around, but I saw him a few times. And okay. I, I told him, I said, I don't know what to call you. <laughs> what did he say? He said, just, he said, don't call me. He said, don't call me anything. Just, you know, just don't call me Prince. Yeah, yeah. I already had a problem with people actually calling him Prince at yeah, that time. Yeah, Okay. So you guys continued to tour and uh, we dropped a new album uh, in 2011, uh, Condensate. Yeah. How did that one do? Wow, that record didn't do well at all. Um, it was sort of doomed in its own way uh, out of the box because we weren't able to use our signature name, The Time. So we had to be creative. Uh, the original seven, you could look at it like the original seven members the original seven letters, the time, um, but it didn't catch on. Uh, partly um, because I don't think we had a good business plan. We tried to do everything internally. Uh, Terry Lewis is a very, very smart guy, but he also, you know, kind of wants to do a lot. And so he was kind of being our music uh, rep, you know, in, the liaison between us and the label and everything, which I think we really needed somebody to handle all of that for us and have a, a plan in place before the record came out. And we were just kind of handling things as they happened instead of having a solid plan in advance. Well, leading up to 2016, 
were you in contact with Prince at all? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, he, this dude, uh, he, he stayed in touch with me. Like I said, uh, the most obscure moments of the day, the phone would ring and, uh, you know, or else he'd come to a show or else we'd go to his show. He called uh, Jerome and I to do Coachella with him one year. Uh, we, we were, um, you know, we, and, you know, you know, we did musicology with him. Uh, Coachella, we went on unannounced and did the Bird and Jungle Love. And so, you know, through the years, he would keep in touch. Were you guys still close or just it, a gig it, and then it, that's it? No, it's funny because, you know, I mean, you know how you can be apart from somebody and you'd be like, oh, he's fucked up, you know? And then you see people and, and, and a lot of times that animosity just goes away and you're, you're happy to see them. It was always that kind of thing uh, where, you know, we, we might not talk for a year or a few years or whatever, but it seemed like every time, you know, we crossed each other's paths, it was genuine. And he was sitting on a massive amount of music at the time. From what I understand that he was just working himself to death up to his, his, final, his final day. Um, because even though he wasn't putting out albums, he kept making albums. He kept making songs just over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. even when we were kids, you know, we'd, he, he, you know he told me uh, he had 100 songs in his, uh, you know, binder <laughs> before, you know, he even got to uh, his first single. So that was his thing, man, cutting, right? <laughs> music. Yeah, and I remember one of the things that he said, well, the story goes that because he was a Jehovah's Witness, he didn't want like a, um, like a hologram of him after the, after the fact, after he passed, because he felt that was demonic. <laughs> you know anything about yeah. that? No, well, we, we hologrammed him up in the book. That's what we did. <laughs> we, we conjured up his voice in the book, you know, so that's how we did it. But no, I didn't. You know, like I said, you know, I was, um, you know, there was a time when we were kids and, and early on and with the music's breaking and man, we talked about everything. But, you know, once I was out of the camp, that was it. I was really out of the information loop. And so it just, you know, the little bit of time that we spent uh, creatively trying to do stuff, it just, you know, it wasn't the same. So I didn't really hear a lot about, you know, his beliefs and all that. Yeah, I mean, quite a loss, yeah. quite a loss. Yeah. What do you think was your greatest moment with Prince? If you look at all the years you guys spent together. Hmm. Greatest moment. If you could just relive one moment with him right now. Man, I would just say, um, I would say probably that first record that we cut together. I mean, we laughed, we partied, we went out, we would go out, go to the club, go back, cut. Um, I mean, it was just, it was just, and, and it was coming out magic. The songs were coming out magic. And it was to the point where, you know, the house, we cut this, a lot of it in the house that he bulldozed, uh, that his father lived in. Um, obviously Prince lived there at the time, had a studio there and uh, it was on a lake. And so we, you know, some nights, you know, two o'clock in the morning, the cops are knocking. <laughs> you guys got to stop. You know, the music's, you know, uh, reflecting across the lake and, you know, the neighbors are up. And so, you know, just those times, man, we were, um, we're living a, uh, it, it was a, it, it was really um, enriched musically and friendship and all of that. You know, and there's so many artists that have come out over the decades. But it seems like Michael Jackson and Prince are the two that people really put on a pedestal above all yeah. all others. Why do you think that is? Well, I think the numbers kind of speak to that. You know, they touched, you know, um, the world, you know, with their music. Yeah. Yeah, even, even to this day. Yeah. And... Uh, about a year later, uh, at the Grammy Awards, you guys actually did a tribute to Prince with the original lineup. Yeah. Uh, and then Bruno Mars, I think, did something after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that bittersweet? It was cool, man. Um, I thought, you know, um, I thought it was cool. I, 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 I'm not going to say bittersweet. I, I enjoyed it. I, you know, I found something out about Bruno. I didn't know he could play guitar like that. <laughs> Yeah, and then you guys just had a recent performance once again. Yeah. At the Soul Train Awards? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everyone was talking about that. 
it was awesome, man. It was awesome because um, it was it was nice just to be in the house to see Jimmy and Terry uh, get honored. But it was also awesome uh, because that band was incredible. So that was only the second time that I heard my songs played with a real horn section. And they were firing, man. I was loving it. It was like Christmas time for me. And one other time when we did Coachella, when Prince called us out to do Coachella, his band at the time had a horn section. And that was the other time that I've heard the song. So it, it was it was it was an incredible, incredible night. Well, Morris Day is a hell of a story, uh, a hell of a life. And by the way, you look great oh, these days. <laughs> uh, you're still doing music. Oh, man. Yeah. Like I said, you got the new book out and uh, you killed it at the Soul Train Awards. Appreciate you haven't it, missed a step. Appreciate it, man. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry for your loss with Prince. I know you guys had your ups and downs over the years, but I, I'm pretty sure you, you're glad that. Well, you know, it's, 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 you know, the thing is, we're all heading in that direction, so we'll party later. This, this <laughs> you can't true. get past that door, man. <laughs> this is true. We're all gonna end up where Prince is right, right now right. at some point. Well, Morris, thank you again for coming in. Uh, I've been a big fan since I was a kid. My oh, man. And uh, you have some classic songs, uh, classic movie scenes. And, uh, man, just looking forward to what you have ahead. Appreciate that, man. No doubt. Until yeah. next time. All right, my man. Peace.